Last year, the city of Reno conducted a micromobility pilot program. Temporary bike infrastructure was installed downtown so the city could collect surveys and present the results later. I have been meaning to make an update video on this project, but it has become apparent that there is a long due process before this amounts to anything. Looking back, I don't think it was the best idea to conduct the micromobility pilot in the downtown area. People are stingy about losing space for cars, and there is a stigma against riding bikes. People view it as a leisure activity or a children's toy, not as a legitimate form of transportation. It is possible to overcome this stigma, but a pilot project is not helpful. I believe it would be more effective to skip the pilot and jump straight into building the infrastructure. This can be done without a pilot because there is nothing to test and there are no secrets. Every problem that could be encountered during a test pilot has already been solved. If you want answers, you can buy the Crow Design Manual for Bicycle Traffic, which is available in English. So I did. The Crow Design Manual is used by the Netherlands to create their bike infrastructure, and it is far more sophisticated than the painted bike gutters that are found throughout North America. I want to use this manual's teachings to imagine a bike network for Reno. For the sake of brevity, I am only going to focus on the portion of town surrounding Plum Lane and Kitsky Lane. Before delving into how to build the bike network, the Crow Design Manual greets the reader with a short passage about the importance of the bicycle. The bicycle is indispensable in the Netherlands when it comes to mobility, quality of life, and health. The overall benefits of bicycle use are considerable. This is due to the fact that the bicycle, in terms of both requisite space and budget, enables good mobility without adversely affecting urban quality of life. The economic significance of bicycle traffic is evidenced from, for example, the sizable portion of cyclists responsible for retail sales in inner cities. The benefits of cycling cannot be ignored. Economically, it is cheaper for individuals to own a bike than a car, so it helps lower the cost of living and it gives people more spending money. It helps the city save money on building and maintaining infrastructure so they can have higher quality roads and better public services. Bikes require less space for storage and movement than cars, so there is far better land use. People who ride bikes are generally healthier because they get more exercise. Bikes have zero emissions and they are quiet, so the space occupied by cyclists is far more pleasant than a strode filled with a bunch of loud, smelly cars. More people can ride a bike than drive a car, so a city that is easily traversable by bike is fundamentally more accessible. Everyone who chooses to get around by bike instead of a car is ultimately helping make the city a better place to live. So the infrastructure must support that choice. I have heard plenty of excuses for why North America must be dependent on cars. I have even received comments from people who felt the need to remind me that it gets hot in Reno, even though I live here. I know what the weather is like. If the hot, cold, rainy, snowy days were an issue, then surely there would be more cyclists when the weather isn't bad. I filmed on a Saturday afternoon when it was only 60 degrees outside, and I still hardly saw any cyclists. Weather isn't the reason Reno is car dependent, and other excuses for why we need cars are a distraction from the real problem. There is no infrastructure to support alternatives to cars. The Netherlands doesn't have perfect weather, and it isn't flat as a pancake either. Yet, people still ride bikes because their government recognized numerous benefits for bike infrastructure, and they created a system to make it safe and accessible. I have no reason to believe Reno cannot accomplish the same, especially if it follows the instructions laid out in the Crow Design Manual. This manual outlines four requirements for a bike network. Cohesion, directness, safety, and attractiveness. Cohesion refers to how well connected the cycle network is to road sections and destinations. Directness has two components, distance and time. Since a bike is a human-powered machine, people will prefer the shortest route possible, where they can minimize time spent waiting at traffic lights. 
The bike network should minimize disruptions from the flow of movement. Safety is described as the absence of physical or psychological danger or threats. Safety can be achieved by avoiding conflicts with intersecting traffic, segregating vehicle types, reducing speed at points of conflict, ensuring recognizable road types, and ensuring uniform traffic situations. Finally, attractiveness refers to having connections pass through lively areas in a varied environment with a well-maintained public space. The connections must also be as lit as possible, referring to both the dictionary definition and the urban dictionary definition. It is important for designers to keep these characteristics in mind. Rather than merely following a design schematic, they should put themselves in the shoes of the intended writers and be mindful if it is sufficient for the intended users. The next three steps involves creating the network itself. Creating a bike network starts with charting the most important starting locations and destinations. Much like how good transit must take people from the places they live to the places they want to go to, good bike infrastructure must have safe, contiguous connections from the places people live to the places they want to go to. A destination can be shopping areas, government buildings, schools and universities, sports and recreational facilities, business parks, transit hubs, etc. Once origins and destinations have been identified, the desire lines are used to indicate the links between origins and destinations. In this neighborhood, the origin points are the residential homes and the apartment complexes. The destination points are the shopping centers, the theater, the parks, the casino, and the many public schools that occupy the area. The desire lines would travel as the crow flies between the origin points and the nearby key locations. The second step is to transform the desire lines into routes. In principle, the shortest, most direct route should be chosen. Unfortunately, there are two major arterials that interfere with direct connections between this neighborhood, Plum Lane and Kitsky Lane. The Crow Design Manual advises against placing a bike path along busy roadways due to air and noise pollution. Instead, we should look for low traffic streets for the cycle route and give bicycles primacy there. Here is a map of what I believe may be adequate side streets for a cycle network. Although, I do want to point out how annoyed I am by the Reno Experience District having a wall by Grove Street. It would be great if they opened it up, allowing for easier access to the theater and the shopping center. Until then, a detour along Rondell Way and Apple Street may suffice. These streets would form the skeleton of the network. This network would allow people in the surrounding neighborhoods to travel between home, school, parks, the theater, grocery stores, and so on. After finding routes to the link origins and destinations together, the third step is to confront other modes of transportation. This step determines a cycle network's quality and safety. The likelihood of casualties increases when riding along or crossing busy arterials and boulevards, so the bike network must be integrated in a way that allows bike and car traffic to exist in harmony. Ideally, people on bikes should be separated whenever possible. I would propose placing the bike path on a curb as though it is an extension of the sidewalk to better send the message that it is not a place for cars and to help deter people from driving or parking on it. The space for bike paths can easily be created by removing on-street parking. Reno has an overabundance of parking, and the on-street parking can be a bit of a menace for cyclists. They present a hazard due to opening doors and maneuvers when entering or exiting the parking spot. For this reason, parking should be discouraged along the main cycle street. It would be best to remove the parking entirely and replace it with a raised cycle track. Similarly, a lot of streets in Reno are overbuilt, with far more lanes than they actually need. Taking away a lane in some streets would also allow for more space for cyclists. One important edge case is handling a bike path running through a bus stop. The Crow Design Manual recommends against having buses and bikes share the same road. A bus is a fast-moving vehicle that makes frequent stops, while a bike is a slow-moving vehicle that moves continuously. This incompatibility may also be a nuisance to cyclists. Instead, the bus should stop in the street, with a bike path wrapping around the transit stop itself. This way, transit riders and bikes can share the space without impeding each other. 
When a path arrives at a junction, it is best to use a protected intersection. Painted bike gutters tend to weave between a turn lane to reduce right hook collisions, but it actually makes bike riding more dangerous because the cyclist has to weave through car traffic. A protected intersection maximizes safety by completely removing conflicts between bikes and other cars. These intersections should also prioritize people who are riding bikes, which can be achieved by placing them on a leading pedestrian interval that allows both pedestrians and cyclists to proceed before the cars move. This would help make people feel more comfortable with riding around town since it would reduce conflicts with cars, pedestrians, and bikes. It is important to note that not every place is going to need protected intersections and protected bike paths. On low traffic streets with ample traffic calming, it may be acceptable for bikes and cars to share traffic. However, it is still preferable to separate bikes and cars whenever possible. Even if a street is low traffic, it can still be daunting to share it with other cars because of their size and their speed. Overall, this map represents what can be accomplished by just removing the space for cars and giving people a spot to ride their bikes. From here, the bike network can further be expanded to allow more people in Reno to benefit from a contiguous bike network. It would simply use the same principles to create other grids and join them together. On one hand, drivers won't be able to park where they used to, and they may have to wait at lights longer, which is a fate worse than death. On the other hand, it helps lower the cost of living because people wouldn't spend as much for transportation, it promotes more physical activity, it helps people who can't drive have more independent mobility, it improves city finances because it is cheaper to maintain a bike path than a strode, it reduces noise pollution and carbon emissions, and the list goes on. The benefits outweigh the consequences, and it's not even close. There's also a bit of a paradox to making things worse for drivers. If everyone could drive and park everywhere, then that is what people would do. But if riding a bike put people on a more direct path to their destination, then some of these car trips would instead be taken by bike. The traffic situation would be a lot better if a portion of these drivers were on bikes instead of in cars. Building the bike network is not the hard part. It's convincing people that it is necessary. The general public won't be convinced that a bike network is useful until it starts being built and it starts being built right. So rather than wasting time with engagement surveys and community meetings, it would be better to embrace building the much needed bike infrastructure and allow people to experience its benefits firsthand.